One of this week's labs looks at genetics and uses corn as a model organism to look at uh, the inheritance uh, of genes. And in this lab, you'll be asked to apply many of the principles that you learned in the genetic, the actual, actually several genetics chapters that we've covered so far. And you'll have to, to use your knowledge of monohybrid crosses. But in addition to that, you're going to be asked to do dihybrid crosses. Dihybrid crosses are something that we do cover uh, in this class in the uh, lab that you would have had if you took this class on Asbury's campus. And so I want to briefly go over dihybrid uh, crosses at this particular point. What I have on the screen is a dihybrid cross. Dihybrid crosses will be very simple if you understood monohybrid crosses. So when we do a dihybrid cross, all that we're doing is tracking two traits at once. Um, remember, we, up to this point, we've only looked at one trait at a time, but in, in a dihybrid cross, you'll be tracking two traits at once. In this case, we're doing a, a, the one on the screen that is, we're doing a replication of one of the crosses that Mendel did. And so the two traits that we're looking at are the color of the, the surface of the pea, um, the, the uh, fruit produced by the pea plant, and the texture of the seed coat. And so the seed is either green or yellow, and it's either round or wrinkled and the gene for, so let's look at them by category. So as far as color goes, the dominant allele is, uh, the dominant allele is yellow, represented by capital Y, as we see at the top of our screen here. And the lowercase allele is green, um, the, the recessive allele is green, represented by a lowercase y. And so you can see that green only shows up if it's present in homozygous state. Now as far as texture goes, round, um, is the, or in other words, a smooth coat is the dominant state represented by dom, uh, capital R and then wrinkled is the recessive state represented by lowercase r. And so those are the two traits that we want to look at. So here's how the, the cross that we have on the screen that we're going to use as an explanation goes. We have a pea plant that's yellow and round and one that's green and wrinkled. And so this P plant has both the dominant traits, this P plant has both the recessive traits. We cross them together and in the F1 generation, in other words in the, in the children, if you want to look at it that way, that are produced from these offspring, phenotypically all of the offspring are yellow and round. None of them show either of the two recessive phenotypes. But genotypically they're all heterozygous and so this is easy for you to see. All right, you can think through this quite easily. So remember, this parent can only donate one of these two alleles for color. This parent has to donate one of these two alleles for color. And so e either way, if this parent donates the one I'm pointing to now on the left or the one on the right, they're both going to be an allele for yellow, the dominant allele. And so that's what we see here. This parent the same way, except it's always this parent's always going to do donate the recessive allele. And so Using that logic then, you can see that all of the offspring that are produced are going to be heterozygous, but pheno genotypically, but phenotypically they're all going to display the dominant traits. Now things get, so th that was a dihybrid cross. Uh, we were tracking two traits at once, and that one you can do in your head. You don't have to, you could do the method I'm going to tell you next, but you could save a lot of time just by thinking it through and doing it in your head. Things get a little bit more complicated when we do the, the cross that we're going to do next, and so here, we take two of these offspring, um, they're plants and, and you, you could say they are siblings, they're, they're from both of these parents here. So we take a male and a female plant and we cross them together and we want to know what we'll get as far as offspring go as a result of this cross. And so here's the key, listen to me closely here, here is the key when you do a dihybrid cross. Remember that when you set up your Punnett square, of course you're going to have 16 squares, you realize that. If you're tracking one trait, then you just have four squares. If you're tracking two traits, you have 16 squares. But the key is that what you're going to place on each side of this big Punnett square are the alleles. You're placing the alleles there. And so how do you determine what alleles will be produced? This is my recommendation to you on how to do that. So. Here we have this female, and she is going to donate one of each of these pairs of alleles to the eggs that she produces. And so, think about it this way. In an egg, she could place a allele for, an allele for yellow, the, the capital Y, 
and she could uh, place an allele for round, the capital R. Or she could place the allele for yellow that we see there, and that could pair with the lowercase allele, the allele for wrinkle. Would you agree with that? Or she could donate the allele for green, the, the lowercase Y, and she could donate the allele for round, the uppercase R. That we, that's what we see here. Or both of these recessive alleles, lowercase y, lowercase r, could go together. And so those are the four alleles that she could produce. And those go, uh, four allele combinations, excuse me, that she could produce. And so each of these things that we see here that I'm pointing to now represents an egg. And of course we won't go through and do the male. You know, actually, I'm sorry, I, they say the female is going over here. I was pointing to up here, but it doesn't matter. You can see that both in both cases this would be exactly the same. And so the male's gametes uh, look just like the female's gametes. And so you put the male gametes on one side of your square, the female gametes on the other side of your square, and then you just combine the gametes. And so here, if this sperm meets this egg, you end up with two dominant alleles for color. So the, the color is uh, certainly yellow and it's homozygous dominant genotypically and you end up with two dominant alleles for seed texture and so the seed texture is round and it's homozygous dominant for round and you simply need to go through and do that for each of these squares this sperm, uh, rather this egg meets this sperm this egg meets this sperm and so forth and so you could certainly go through this whole square here and fill in um, all of those uh, alleles now at the end of this whole process th this is another important point you're not reporting the genotypic ratio here. The genotypic ratio would be crazy with, with lots of numbers. I'm saying genotypic. You're not doing that. You are interested in the expected phenotypic ratio. Now we can't see the genotype anyway, so we don't worry about that. But what you're interested in is the phenotypic ratio. And so the phenotypic ratio can be determined by simply making a little chart and going through and saying, okay, what's this one going to be? It's going to be yellow and round. I would suggest making four categories, which is exactly what we have here. Yellow round, green round, yellow wrinkled, and green wrinkled. And then then just go through box by box. Yellow and round, put a one right there. Uh, and then actually look at this one. So genotypically, this one that I'm pointing to now is different than that, but it, phenotypically they're the same, right? Yellow and round. And this one's also the same, yellow and round. And this one is also the same, yellow and round. All four of those phenotypically are the same. So you just have to go through and, and uh, count up uh, what is, uh, is what here. And here's a hint as well. What you're going to find in every case when you cross two individuals that are heterozygous for both traits, which is what we did just now, you're always going to find that you get a 9, I'm pointing down here now, 9-3-3-1 ratio. Nine of the individuals have both dominant traits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine individuals are yellow and round. That's Those are both dominant traits. Three of the individuals are going to have one dominant trait and one recessive trait. So for instance, this is yellow and wrinkled, yellow and wrinkled, yellow and wrinkled. So they have the dominant trait as far as color goes, but recessive trait as far as seed coat goes. Another three individuals are going to be just the inverse of that. They're going to have the other dominant trait and the trait that was dominant is going to be recessive. So here these are. So these in this case have the dominant trait for seed coat which is round but they have the recessive gene, uh, the recessive phenotype for color which is green. Green and round, green and round, green and round and then one out of 16 uh, will have both recessive traits. Green the recessive trait for color and wrinkled the recessive trait for seed coat. And so this is the expected ratio that you would see only if, remember this, only if both individuals are heterozygous for both traits. And so remember when you do these um, chi-squares, which is another thing that, that we haven't talked about, but the chi-square analysis is a very simple analysis and it's explained very well in your lab. Um, the gist of the chi-square is this. You want to test to see if what you actually observe, what I'm pointing to right here, is the same as what you expected to see. So the expected values come from the results of your Punnett square. The observed values are, of course, the, value, the values that you get from the crosses that you do, or in the case of the lab, the values that you're given uh, from the, as a result of doing those crosses. 
And so that, that's the purpose of a chi-squared, to compare observed minus uh, expected, uh, I'm sorry, to compare observed values to expected values and see if, if they match. And we have a standard that we use that you see described in the lab, and that's 5%. And so we say that if the values are meet the, this idea of a, a p-value of 5%, then, then it, it passes. We're satisfied that the observed values do match the expected values. A p-value of 0.05, or 5%, is nearly universally used in science. There, there are some fields of science, ecology and uh, perhaps um, sociology, where you might use a, a little bit uh, larger or a little bit smaller p-value, but most of the time in science that p-value of 0.05 is, is used. And so uh, I encourage you to also make use of the additional videos that I, that I have posted. Uh, I have posted videos from uh, Khan Academy, both for the dot hybrid crosses and for the, an explanation of using a um, chi-square analysis. Um, and certainly let me know if you have any questions uh, regarding this lab.